If you look at it, people want to get computers that work faster and faster. They want to spend less time surfing the internet. They want to solve problems that they just can't do. They want more graphics. So whatever's happening internationally in the world of um, silicon chips, they are getting smaller every year. And that's actually driven by the market. The market wants things smaller, they want things faster. In computers, size matters. We're rapidly approaching the time when we can't physically fit any more transistors onto a silicon chip. So the next big thing in computers is very small. Implanting single atoms instead of transistors and UNSW is one of the world's leading quantum computing research groups. And it's been theoretically predicted many years ago, if you could make a, a computer that worked in the quantum regime, you would be able to solve problems you just can't do with classical computers. If you, if you look traditionally, we've had what's called the digital era, where information is stored in essentially one or two states, and essentially a charge state, it's either one or zero, on or off. And everything we see around us, all the computers we use, work in the classical regime. And by going to a quantum system, you can start to encode information not just in the one or zero, the magnitude, but you can put it on the spin. And the spin can contain a lot more information. And so the, the rationale for going to looking at a single spin is that you can use the quantum properties of that spin to put basically more information and be able to entangle these spins together. And the idea really being that if you can control it at the quantum level, you'll be able to get this kind of exponential speed up in computational power. An atom, surrounded by its electron cloud, works right at the edge of what we know about physics. The electron has a spin, the angular momentum of its magnetic field. You can describe that spin as spin up or spin down, so measuring it, you could say it holds two bits of information, just like a transistor. But it can also be up and down, or somewhere in the middle, all at the same time. And that's the weird world of the quantum bit, or qubit, the basic building block of a quantum computer. First of all, you've got to create the single atom device, and the technology to do that just wasn't, didn't exist 10 years ago. Um, how do you put a single atom in silicon? How do you encapsulate it so it's in a crystalline environment, so it's still within the semiconductor host material? And then how do you actually put wires down to connect to that single atom so that you can control that single atom? To manipulate atoms, you have to be inside a, a microscope, such as the one behind me, and that works in an ultra-high vacuum environment. So it's a big piece of stainless steel with no, no air, anything inside, so it's a vacuum. And in that vacuum environment, you can manipulate the atoms. And that literally uses a very fine metal tip. And that metal tip, you actually move it across the surface of a crystal. So you see the atoms on the surface, and you literally move that metal tip across, and as it goes over the atom, it deflects. And what you're doing is you're measuring a current and keeping it constant. And as it deflects, you're measuring that small change in current as it goes up in height. And so with such a technique, you've been able to image the atoms on the surface. And then by applying pulse voltages to the tip at certain points, you can actually change the chemistry of the surface. And typically what we do on the silicon surface is we take a silicon surface, nice and clean, and we put down one layer of hydrogen atoms. So it just literally has a silicon-hydrogen bond. And then with the STM technique, we can apply a voltage to the tip just above that silicon hydrogen bond and literally release one hydrogen atom from the surface leaving a, a dangling bond. And that's very reactive. And to that reactive dangling bond we bring in phosphine gas which will only stick to that dangling bond and nowhere else on the surface. And it's in such a way that we can bring that phosphorus and put it exactly in the one atomic lattice placing of where we want it. And then once we've done that we encapsulate with silicon over the top of it. And by encapsulating with silicon, we surround it with silicon atoms. So it's sitting one phosphorus atom, silicon all the way around it. It's a nice, clean environment for that phosphorus atom. So here, this is our scanning tunneling microscope on the, on the right-hand side here. And this is connected under ultra-high vacuum with a piece of stainless steel to a molecular, a molecular beam epitaxy system. So once we've done the atomic manipulation next door, we bring it through the stainless steel tube to our crystal growth system. And in here we have sources basically of silicon and germanium, which are basically lumps of silicon and lumps of germanium that are heated up with an electron beam, and they evaporate inside this ultra-high vacuum chamber. And ideally what we want in this crystal growth system is for the pressure to be as low as possible. So when we heat the silicon up, the only thing that's coming towards our surface is silicon, nothing else. We don't want any impurities. And the way that we do that is we have this thin skin inside the UHV system which goes up to a big tube that's hooked up to a liquid nitrogen tank. So we literally run liquid nitrogen through here 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And that's really, really cold. 
So any other atoms that are floating around in that vacuum system stick to the walls and they don't go into the crystal. So the pressure gets really, really low. And we also have shutters on each of these controllers here that sit across the silicon cell. And we can open the shutter for very short periods of time and literally grow one atomic layer of silicon at a time. But to get that beautiful, nice, pristine, clean vacuum, we also have to have pumps. And those pumps are vibrating. You can hear it's quite noisy in here. And those pumps allow you to pull out all the molecules in there that you don't want before you put your silicon growth. And as a consequence, the whole system is literally vibrating in this room. And we've designed it so that it actually sits on a concrete block that goes 10 meters into the ground on a completely separate um, board to the rest of the lab. So the vibrations are taken out of the building into the sand. And then the STM sits next door on the other foundations of the building. So the vibration is completely isolated between the two. I guess it's um, very few people have, well, actually several groups have tried to connect these two technologies before and they found that um, the vibrations from the crystal growth side actually destroyed the imaging that you would get with the STM. So it's actually very difficult to bring those two technologies together. Um, so we actually literally had to work with lots of engineers with both of the companies and independent acoustic engineers to bring the two, two, two technologies together. It's a very expensive system, it cost about three million dollars. It was a, one of those turning points, certainly in my career, because if they didn't come together and work, that probably would have been the end of me. Um, and it took about 18 months to a year, two years, to get the system online. But when we finally designed it, we, uh, we got it here and it worked beautifully and actually worked about a factor of six better than we predicted. So We built the whole crystal structure inside the vacuum, one, mono, one atomic layer by a time. And then at the end, we take it out. And then we have to find it. And that was one of the first challenges we had, was how do we find that single phosphorus atom? And what we've done is, over the last um, five to ten years, is we've developed techniques and patented them. We're making markers in the surface that are visible all the way through when you put it in vacuum and when you take it out, and making sure that phosphorus atom is registered with respect to that marker. But how do you connect to the outside world? The, the connections that you've got to make have got to be as small as you can make them, so that when you um, literally try and address the atom, you're just addressing that atom and not all the atoms around it. So when you take it out, you can see the marker, you put down your metal electrodes on the surface that control the spin states and the electron states of the phosphorus atoms, and then you apply voltages to those on the surface. So at the end of the day, you'd have a device you can hold in your hand, so it's a real device, it's not working inside the vacuum system but outside. And that's obviously fundamentally important to having some kind of device where you really control it in terms of temperature and magnetic field. The quantum state of the phosphorus atom, now locked in its silicon cage, is fragile. To detect its spin and then control it requires extraordinary finesse. The smallest outside interference could affect it, so any manipulation of spin is at very low temperatures. So you need everything to be cold so you can isolate the quantum system and separate the energy levels out. So we're using phosphorus because it has one extra electron than the silicon atoms in the, in the crystal that surround it. And we actually use that electron spin as, the, as the, the source of the information holder. So that's our qubit, the electron spin on the phosphorus atom. What we're looking at here is uh, a single electron site where we're first emptying an electron. That's what we're doing over here. Um, in the second step, we load one single electron, and in the third step, the readout step, we look whether it's spin up or spin down. So what we see here is first a spin up electron tunneling in, and then after that, a spin down electron tunneling back out again. So that's our detection of a single electron spin. To me, as a physicist, this is actually the most amazing thing that, that, I've, that I've done in my scientific career, to be able to, to observe something that I would never be able to see with the bare eye, and and still we get it visible with these extremely sensitive measurements to look at one single electron spin instead of things that you can touch with your bare hands. It, it, it's been such a long project that it's been, uh, it was amazing once we first saw this clear signal, this, this bulletproof signature that we actually have one electron spin. It's, it's amazing and we were, yeah, well, nearly dancing in the lab, but not, not really that bad, but uh, <laughs> we might have been. You know, they're such a fragile thing, you know, but actually we measure them every day and every day I come in, we look at the devices that we make and I look at the images and I go, wow, that's beautiful. <laughs> and it never ceases to amaze me. It really doesn't. And, and every day, I'll be honest with you, every day, even though we've now studied the system for a number of years, every day there is something on that surface, an, an interaction that's occurring that I don't understand. And I'm like, where did that come from? What's that from? And so it's always a surprise. It's never boring. And I mean, to be honest, every device that we make in itself, you never know with the device how it's going to work. Because it's so much smaller than any other 
device that can be made, the way that it behaves is completely non-intuitive. And all the models that you use normally to model a classical device, which fit nicely and explain everything, they don't work in the quantum world. Um, so even to the point when we, we made very recently our first real single atom device, and then we started saying, well, what happens if we bring another atom in? What will it do? And it was such a simple question, two atoms. Well, it can't change things that, that much, but actually it changes things phenomenally. And then we realized if we had a five atom device, it already with our system, five atoms is too difficult for us to understand and write equations down that can solve it. So, um, and realizing that we have the ability to control right at that fundamental level means that we actually can start to understand what happens as you bring them in one by one. What do you do when you place them? And really that's the fundamentals almost of nature, of how chemistry works, how biology works, you know? So it's really incredible.